folks standing in the stairs. Not going to be able to do that. Cannot be blocking the exits. We can allow if there are, unless the forum had indicated no. They said it was fine. Um, if there are some young folks that want to sit here on the carpet in front, we can do that. But you cannot be out here on the wood floor and cannot be blocking the stairwells. So no standing in them, no blocking them. One row of people sitting here is fine, and there still are probably a dozen seats scattered around that I see. Yeah, so so. If, if there are seats near you, you know, kind of hold your hands up so the people standing around can grab. Thank you. So the folks standing back there, these folks that have their hands up, if you want to catch a seat, come catch a seat now. That man put his hand up to try and get someone to sit where she was sitting. I got it. So there's there's two seats over here, three seats, four seats over there, two, three seats over here. Yes, you will. young people sitting around here. She tried to figure out what the This is Mike Hot. Barry Hudson can hear me. Can I see you, please? I kind of like this. speaker, I'd like to go over the rules for tonight's proceedings. First, I'd like to ask everyone to put their cell phones on vibrate during tonight's hearing. In order to provide everyone the opportunity to present testimony this evening, a time limit of three minutes will be imposed. I will have a timer set for three minutes. When there's 30 seconds left, I will hold up a sign reflecting 30 seconds. Once the timer has expired, an alarm will sound. Please be considerate of others and wrap your comments up at that time. Thank you, and our first speaker will be Colin Dunphy. Oh, let me do this. I'm sorry. Yeah, let me just let me do this real quick so that we know who's all in the um, uh, in the audience because I know there's going to be a lot of questions. If I can, if we can real quickly, I know there's a crowd here. Um, can y'all hear me back there? Yeah. Great. These new things are working. Those of you who actually work for the Prince George's County Government uh, Director or Deputy CAO, if you can yell out, stand up, 
So we'll know who's in there. That way, if questions come up, I can actually point you out for people to, uh, I see two right up there. So uh, why don't we start in the back over there. I see Linda and people. Thomas, you're hiding. Quickly. Echoing around here. Martin Harris, Deputy Director of Public Works and Transportation. Okay. Mr. Rijazi D5, Permanent Inspector Enforcement. Mark Asher, of our EMS. And Gregor, Health Department. Gloria Brown, Social Services. Teresa Graham, Family Services. Anybody? Anybody? <laughs> Y'all. Did I miss anyone? All right, that, that way we make sure that um, th there may be through tonight as you're talking, I'll look to one of these individuals that, uh, that work very hard for your government. Um, another quick thing before we start with the first testimony. Uh, those of you who may have saw yesterday, I was in Annapolis for the governor's state of the state. Uh, one of, I'm getting like real feedback. Uh, I'm hearing it. I'm hearing it? Okay. Uh, two things that I think are important from the uh, conversation yesterday about the governor's state of state. The first is for us in Prince George's County, um, we not only lost $15 million for the Prince George's Hospital, which is critical to us uh, keeping that hospital open uh, last year. Uh, we lost another $15 million, which the state was committed to do to put in the, um, to put, to put in the, um, the hospital for this year. Out of our school budget, we lost $20 million last year, uh, which we have no way of making up for um, in the budget for, for this year. Uh, I bring that up because as we're thinking about, you know, this upcoming budget and the, and the decisions we have to make, the decisions we have to make, um, I want you to keep in mind that we have to make part of uh, getting revenues for this county is having our partners in Annapolis actually, you know, fight for it. So if you get a chance to call the governor or run into him in the streets, you know, maybe shopping around here somewhere, you might want to ask him uh, about the money that goes into the very hospital, the second busiest trauma center in the state, where that money is. Because without that money, we cannot keep that hospital open. And those of you who are going to talk about our education system, which is critically important here in Prince George's County, uh, last year's budget, we tried to increase the amount that we put in education. Uh, we increased it by a very small amount. So $20 million is a big hit for us. Uh, we certainly, you know, we, what was our budget deficit last year? Do you remember? Yeah, before we... It was about over, about 114, about 114 million dollars budget deficit we started off uh, last year before we closed it. So getting a 20 million dollar hit is is hard for us. So if you happen to see him, you know, around the parks, uh, just tell him, you know, we could use the money and we'll accept cash, credit, or check. With that, we're eager to hear from you. This is your chance to tell us what you want to see in this budget. If you have some great ideas on how we can uh, uh, increase revenues, save money, we want to hear that also. But it really is going to be about, about you, not uh, uh, so much. We take your ideas back uh, when we make a decision on what we're going to present to the council. Uh, in the coming months, you will hear of some of the ideas that we had in, this, in a form just like this that we actually incorporated into our budget. So we take this very seriously. This is the first of two hearings we'll have throughout uh, the county. This one right here in, in Largo and the next one in Laurel. With that, let's get the ideas flowing. Colin Dunphy. Thank you. 
So we have a mic over here and a mic here. Maybe we can cue people up you right there. The right we there. want everybody to hear your great, terrific idea. You can go up on, yeah. There you go. Hi. Uh, hello. My name is Colin Dunphy, and I'm here to advocate for the refunding of the agricultural marketing specialist position uh, for the year 2016. Uh, My uh, background is actually an organ donation. I uh, was working as an organ donation coordinator for the Washington Regional Transplant Community for seven years until about three years ago when I decided to uh, become a farmer uh, or attempt to be. So um, part of that journey was because uh, organ transplantation is a, a great thing for a lot of people, but it's largely, I think, because of chronic disease. Uh, and I feel like one of the best ways that we can uh, help prevent chronic disease is by securing a, a fresh local food supply. Um, in addition, that would help uh, medical debt, which is uh, crushing so many people. Uh, so. When I decided to try and become a farmer, I realized how hard it is for small farms to succeed uh, in these days. Uh, most farms break even, and most all farmers have an off-farm job. They rely on off-farm income. So the key for small farms is to be diverse, having multiple products with uh, as much control over your, uh, uh, the selling of the product uh, as you can, instead of like, selling to a wholesaler. So you're selling directly to, a, a, you know, uh, to the consumer. That puts a lot of hard, uh, new hats that a farmer has to wear, and it requires a lot of assistance, uh, which is greatly appreciated in the form of this agricultural marketing specialist. Uh, I think Prince George's uh, County's uh, history uh, of agriculture is, is one of its strongest assets and can be, uh, like I said, a, a an opportunity for fixing some of its greatest problems. Um, so please, I advocate for the refunding of that position. Thank you. Thank you. And just so you know, Colin, we're going to be talking to Park and Planning about that. You know, Prince George's County, I believe, we're the second largest agricultural um, area in the state. So thank you. Lincoln Smith. agriculture marketing specialist position. Uh, I'm the owner of Forested, which is a small forest farm in Mitchellville. Uh, we produce duck eggs and mushrooms and fruit and nuts and herbs of various kinds for sale. And as of now, uh, it's, a, it's a new business, a small business. We have one and a half full-time employees, including myself, and we found we have to spend uh, up to a third of our time on marketing activity, and even then we don't always find the customers we need. Uh, so the Ag Marketing Specialist has helped us in a lot of ways over the last couple of years. Um, the most important, I would say, is that she has uh, just connected us. She seems to know everyone in the PG County uh, farming community. And she has connected us with people that are interested in their kind of a very ecologically oriented farming, uh, which has been great. She just helped raise our profile. Uh, she's also given us uh, technical assistance with knowing what regulations we have to uh, look at when we're going to sell produce, set up a farm stand, that kind of thing. Uh, and we've also benefited from the newsletter that she produces uh, where um, we've connected with people through that and been featured in that. And um, so we've benefited a lot from having her there. And I, and I have to assume if she's doing the same thing for uh, farmers throughout PG County, it's producing a tremendous benefit and uh, worth continuing to fund, so uh, thanks for considering uh, refunding the Ag Marketing Specialist uh, for PG County. Thank you. Peter Holden. Good evening, good evening. Before I speak, I would like to ask everybody in this audience that's here representing folks with developmental disabilities and their families to stand 
I think we've marked ourselves by dressing in black. All right. Thank you very much. We're turning out. My name is Peter Holt, and I represent one of the members of the Prince George's County Provider Council. Our group is of 22 different agencies that serve people with disabilities around the county. 2,500 staff, lots of folks that need support. I was excited, I wanted to say, I was excited today when <clears throat> I got an invitation from you, county executive, to come tonight. And what it said is that when we spoke tonight, it would make a difference. It would make a difference. I think that's wonderful. Well, I hope so because we are in a crisis. You say that what we said tonight will make a difference, but what I like to say is I believe, and you're well aware of what we do, what we do every day makes a difference, day in and day out, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, across this county, we make a difference. We're in a situation now where we see that we have and appreciate that the un invaluable support that so many people with special needs receive in this county. But while this is invaluable care, priceless in people's lives, it is costly to give our staff, caregivers, what they deserve. What do they deserve? They deserve a living wage. A living wage. The simple fact is that PG County, we believe, wants that to happen. We're looking at a mandate to raise our salaries from the county, in this county, by 16% this year, 23% next year, and 24% the year after that. We think that's fantastic. Very cool. However, we're looking at a 3% increase in funding from the state of Maryland. There's a big gap. So what do we do? Do we lay off staff? Do we cut positions? Do we take the support away from families that need it? We're looking at the reality of 3% increases with a 23% increase in cost. It's a wonderful mandate. However, there's no money. So we ask you to please support the solution. The solution is supporting a bill that we worked with the legislature on called PG 41416. It will bring the money in to close that gap and keep what you say you want in your budget, which is a quality of life in this county, which we believe you believe. And we ask you for your support, please, of PG 41416. Thank you. I want to be clear, the only thing I'm not sure, does that, and, and I'll find out from our folks whether in fact that includes money from the state coming back to the county. So it will be state money coming to the county. Okay, we'll, we'll look into that. Because if it's state money coming into the county, it's a lot, of, it's a lot different from uh, county money. Because in order for us to pay for it with county money, I have to cut something else. So if you're talking about county money, what will help me if you tell me which programs you'd like me to cut. <laughs> Because that would also help us as we're looking at it. We'll, we'll, we'll do that. Constant Crawford. How much is going? To the Honorable Rashern Baker, County Hello. Council members, community at large, good evening. My name is Constance Crawford, and I thank you for the opportunity to address you this evening regarding Bill PG 4-414-16. My son Dion is here with me this evening, and he attends New Horizons Supported Services Day program. And as part of that experience thus far, Dion has been afforded opportunities that, uh, and services that he may not otherwise have been afforded. Um, as part of the experience, he has had an opportunity to work, and he has earned his first paycheck ever. Oh. So needless to say, as a family, we were very proud of Dion and celebrated his success, and of course, that made him have an additional sense of accomplishment mm. and pride. Now, Dion also has a personal one-on-one -on -one assistant, and what that means is that throughout his day, in order to 
system with his needs, he has someone uh, to help him and aid him. And um, that assistant has been instrumental in helping Dion continue in his development and um, is, is critical as a resource for him. Without the support, um, his care and level of, of service and, and appropriate um, opportunities for him are in jeopardy. So again, we respectfully request support and the funding for Bill 414-16. Um, without it, not only is Dion directly impacted adversely, but it then creates an adverse cascading impact on our, on our world. So we are looking for that support if possible. Thank you for the consideration. Thank you. Ron Weiss. Uh, County Executive Baker, thank you for the opportunity to, to uh, address you tonight. Uh, in response to the dispute between you and the County Council uh, over the two, 2016 budget, we demonstrated in front of the County Executive build, er, Administration building back in November, you might have seen that, in support of additional Police Academy class. I had intended to advocate tonight uh, for increased number of uh, police academy sessions. But I just learned last night, and I see in the program tonight, that uh, you've already addressed that, and I'm, I'm very appreciative of that. It's great news since it will keep the downward trend in our crime rate. Additional officers will have more time to collaborate with our communities in crime prevention. I just ask that disputes between you and the county council never again stand in the way of public safety. Thank you. Thank you. And they never will. Thank you. Donna Dorsey. Donna Dorsey. Ms. Dorsey. Preston Mears. Thank you, Jackie. Yeah, if we have anyone from our staff, no, Preston Mears is here. Anyone from our staff, just in case they help with the mics, so folks don't have to be speakers and also technicians. Yes, Mr. Baker, I'm here to speak for the agricultural marketing specialist, and I have a unique uh, perspective I want to share with you about that. Okay. Uh, I think it's probably misnamed. It should be sort of like connector or facilitator. It's one of those things that makes things work, and when you get a lot of parts working together, good things happen. And you know that as an accounting executive. And sometimes it's marketing specialist doesn't quite get at it. The person is housed with a university extension and does work with uh, people in the farmer community. But it also involves getting people to eat vegetables. I'm a 75-year-old person raised by a farm girl, and my wife is a wonderful cook, and I've been eating vegetables all my life, and I don't think I'm looking too bad for 75 years old. Yeah, you're looking great. <laughs> Thank you. So let's hear it. For, it's for vegetables, and it's for people's health, and it includes people who are on benefits such as SNAP or food stamp benefits, WIC, there's senior citizen programs, and getting all the pieces to work together, getting things so farmers can get enrolled with the Food and Nutrition Service, uh, that takes some doing. And so it, marketing specialist just doesn't really touch all the connections that person is making for people, and you've heard a couple of farm folks say it's, it's accomplishing something for her. Uh, I just want to share with you, I, my wife and I moved down here to uh, Croom Naylor area in 1994 and I worked and just now retired a few years ago full, from full-time work with the Food and Nutrition Service. I went up to New Hampshire originally as a pastor of a church and I got involved with uh, public assistance and food programs for getting parishioners uh, help that they needed. 
I then found myself being a supervisor of a welfare office. And then I moved over to the food and nutrition service for primarily the food stamp, but also the WIC programs. And then I came down here and uh, worked out of headquarters. 25 years ago, I was in New Hampshire. We had an opportunity, small state. It, it gets a lot of attention for a small state once every four years, but it is a small state. And with the work I had done, I knew everybody, or knew somebody who knew everybody. And we put together, 25 years ago, a special effort to get farm stands and farmers markets enrolled. I see that. <laughs> And it involved the university extension, it involved the FNEP nutrition education program because you want to get people to buy the groceries, to have them authorized, to be able to use these things, to get grants, to make it all come together and get all these parts working. Okay, that was just in New Hampshire 25 years ago. Uh, and the farm stand and uh, farmers markets took in $3,000 worth of benefits the prior year. The year we put this work in, it was 30000 Thank you. It makes a difference. Makes a difference. Thank you very much. Howard Burnett. Is this, is this actually Howard Burnett? Yes, it is. It's the Howard Burnett. <laughs> you know, we, you come down here, we'll put you to work. <laughs> actually, yeah, yes. I'm, I've been a career worker now, a career volunteer. I'm going to just... Uh, I had notes and everything to read to you for the first time. I was going to follow my notes, but I'll just speak to you. First, I'm Howard Burnett. I'm the chair of the Human Services Coalition, a group of uh, nonprofit organizations in Prince George's County. We're transitioning our name to nonprofit Prince George's County, which better reflects our composition of members and also reflects what we do to try to serve all nonprofit organizations in Prince George's County. And just on behalf of all nonprofit organizations, I want to personally thank you, your administration, and the agencies for their support, both financially and through collaboration, to nonprofits across the county. I know that more than 150 nonprofit organizations receive financial support from your administration, and hundreds more receive collaboration support from the administration. And that could be in the form of a letter. You provided a letter to us. We got grant funds from the federal government, created the 24-7 online service for all citizens in Prince George's County so that they can connect with any nonprofit organization in, in Prince George's County. So, one, I wanted to thank you for all the work that you and your agencies do. Also, to promote the continued funding of those nonprofit organizations and the continued collaboration. The collaboration provides so much work across the county as all of those nonprofit organizations support infants through seniors and those with dis disabilities, as you know. So, that collaboration makes a wealth of, of, of difference. I know your, your directors of health and human services with your deputy went out to one of the uh, Salvation Army centers where that 150 bed facility in, in Bladesburg provides services to men who are in a six to nine month program. Now social services, health department, Workforce services provide services to those individuals. So again, thank you and your administration, and I want to promote the continued support that you give all nonprofits. Also, I, I'd like to say across Prince George's County, there's a tremendous opportunity to volunteer for all of those nonprofit organizations that are listed online. So please take the opportunity, as I'm doing, to find an organization. If you don't know of one, contact the Human Services Coalition of Prince George's County and attend our monthly meeting. Next week we have foundation funders coming to the library that you let us have our meeting in so that any individual of a nonprofit organization can come and hear those funders talk about how you can, you know, submit grants for funding. So again, thank you. Right on time. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron, and thank you for your service to the county. Really appreciate it. Betty. Nick. Nick. Gary's going to help you, Betty. I think he's going to. Nick Lukey. That's very good. 
How do you do? Thank you. Good, Good. evening. Good evening. Um, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm Nick Lukey. I'm uh, president of the uh, board of the Ark of Prince George's County. And I'm here to urge the county to meet its responsibility to uh, fund direct service providers and support people with intellectual and de developmental, that's easy for me to say, disabilities. Uh, I've spoken on this topic before, uh, and I've often brought my personal perspective to it because I'm a parent uh, of a son who has a developmental disability. But today I'd like to give more of a historical perspective. Uh, uh, the history, at least, that happened in my lifetime and probably in many of yours, and uh, that shows us why this issue is so important. Um, each of us has a place and a role in history and in what happens on our watch. Now, this history begins in the 1950s. Uh, the ARC was started as part of a movement by parents of uh, children with developmental disabilities uh, here in our country and also, at the same time, all across the nation. For some reason, and it's hard to say exactly why, people just started to get concerned about this issue. Now, incredibly, if you think of it, uh, at that time, uh, the children of these parents uh, had no opportunity at all. Uh, they had no right to an education or expectation of an education. They had no right or expectation of work, and they didn't even have an opportunity to live in the community. Instead, they were institutionalized. They were shunted aside, forgotten, and not paid any attention to. Now, jump ahead uh, 20 so years to the 70s. Uh, my wife and I have a son uh, who has a developmental disability, and at that time, we were still told to institutionalize him and forget about him. But uh, we said no. And by that time, uh, things were changing. There was a movement to take people out of institutions. Uh, there was a right to an education, the same as any other child would have. There were work opportunities and day programs. They were becoming available. And most importantly, life in the community was not being denied. Uh, people with uh, developmental disabilities were not being shunted aside and just forgotten anymore. Now, this amazing progress that we've made has been facilitated and implemented by direct service providers. It couldn't have happened without them. Now, at this time, a good and well-intentioned action by the leaders of our county threatens to reverse this arc of progress. The funding for direct service providers who make this progress a reality does not match the well-intentioned higher wage requirement passed by the county. Unfortunately, this good and well-intentioned action did not take direct service providers and the progress that people with developmental disabilities have made into account. I hate to say it, but they were shunted aside, forgotten, and not paid attention to just the way they were in the past. I thought we had moved beyond that. We can't let the progress we've painfully made over the past 60 years stop and reverse itself, especially not because we took a well-intentioned action, but in doing so did not consider the impact on people who've been shunted aside, overlooked, and not paid attention to for too long, uh, for virtually always. Let's not just say oops and let that happen. Let's hold the ground we've gained in our community. I don't want to see the progress reversed and I especially don't want it to see reversed on my watch. And I don't think anybody here would like to see it reversed on their watch either. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Andre Cope. Andrea. <laughs> well, I'll apologize now before anybody else. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Andrea Culp, and I work for a provider agency called Compass Inc. And I'm here with the Prince George's Provider Council, which is, you know, we're just one of over 20 organizations that are part of the council. Um, and we're an association of um, people that serve people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, as you've heard several times tonight. We provide residential, recreational, personal care, and support employment services to hundreds of Prince George's County residents and several more um, staff members who live in Prince George's County. We're a major employer. And we urge your support for PG 41416, which would ask for actually the county's participation in funding a wage factor with the intention of drawing down a federal match on those funds if it filters through the state. Um, and we need this because of the Prince George's County minimum wage and when it was raised by the county in, in that well-meaning 
move, um, it's higher than what we, we would get from the state because our wage factor is based on the state's minimum wage. Direct, uh, direct support staff are the backbone of our critical supports that we provide. Um, direct support professionals are skilled workers that are required to have several hours of state training. They become med medication tech certified through the Board of Nursing. And they provide care for individuals with disabilities, many of whom have complex needs and conditions like autism, cerebral palsy, Down syndrome, and some of whom also have, may have co-occurring mental health conditions like schizophrenia, major depression, and personality disorders. And just on a, a personal note, and just to give you a picture of the kinds of things they might deal with day to day, just this week at Compass, um, an individual who's usually relatively stable and has done volunteer work and held jobs and lives in his own apartment, um, he, he became unstable quite suddenly and um, was having suicidal ideation and thinking about jumping off the Powder Mill Bridge onto Route 95. And it was a very real plan. And, you know, he's been kept stable throughout the years through going to his medical appointments with assistance of, assistance of direct support professionals and counseling and these kinds of things. But once in a while, these things just happen. And our trained staff were able to recognize that this wasn't just an idle threat. And they got him into a hospital right away, and he's there right now. So thankfully, something bad didn't happen. But this is, it took a skilled person to recognize this, and that's the kind of people we, we need to employ. Uh, turnover at Compass last year was 40%. Staff are already working two and three jobs just to make ends meet. And the jobs are meaningful, but they're also stressful and low paying. And as much as people want to make a difference, they also need to make a living. Um, therefore, we're encouraging you to support PG41416 and allow us to help you find a way to find a solution. James Stockton. Thank you. Good evening. Yeah. My name is uh, Jim Stockton, and I'm grateful for this opportunity to, as a parent, to convey the need for salaries, for the increase of salaries of those who provide direct services to our, uh, to our special needs uh, uh, children. Well, they're really not children, chronologically speaking, but uh, I think you know the, the population that I'm talking about. Um, and I know I'm probably going to be somewhat redundant, but I think there's probably a need for some redundancy uh, because we need to impress upon uh, the county and others the, the need to give priority consideration to the salaries of the direct uh, service providers. My daughter is a special needs uh, person, and specifically she was born with uh, Down syndrome. And uh, she attends the ARC of PG County Day Program in Laurel, Maryland. I take, her to school, to, I take her to the program every day. And I observe staff uh, working in very high levels of emotional and, and physical stress, working under that kind of stress. It's not easy, working in a labor-intensive environment such as that. And the needs are so diverse, it just amazes me how they're able to provide services under very extreme and very severe conditions, but they do it. Unfortunately, uh, I also observe that their salaries, for the most part, do not provide, in my estimation, uh, adequate support for the retention and the recruitment of those staff workers. And what that does, that puts our programs, our, our special needs population in jeopardy. It puts their basic quality of life in jeopardy because these direct service providers who are being trained to provide these kind of services would be inclined to go elsewhere in order to be, to be compensated for the work that they do. We're talking about people who are challenged with uh, meeting basic living expenses and are raising their households above subsistence existence. And this cannot 
continue. And I don't think that if you, if you take the basic needs of, of that population in consideration, that you would be hard pressed not to consider the need to um, be instrumental and do whatever it is necessary in order to, to provide salary increases that would be commensurate with the kind of work that they do. So I'm impressing and asking you to give these workers and their welfare a pri priority consideration. Thank you. Thank you. speakers come down and we'll take them on I'm going to go stand in <coughs> good evening uh, my name is Nancy Forsyth I am um, a parent of a uh, young adult with Down syndrome who takes advantage of direct support services um, but I'm also the vice president of the Maryland chapter of the of APC the Association of People Supporting Employment First because I think this is a very important organization to participate in because Maryland is an employment first state. That means that within the state of Maryland, we are now encouraging employment as the first option for um, activities for adults in our state. So rather than um, the first option being a day program or recreation or sports or entertainment or leisure activities, you know, Maryland now says we see the value in having people with developmental intellectual disabilities work. Um, Maryland is recognized nationally as a uh, cutting edge state. Many of the programs that we're implementing here, even though we're in the early stages, many of the programs are recognized nationally. And um, I'm encouraging you to support um, the bill PG 41416 because I would hate to see Prince George's County not able to participate in the successes of these cutting edge employment first programs because our providers cannot recruit and retain the talent that they need. So I encourage you to support the bill. Thank you. Thank you. Ronnie Washington. <coughs> Kenneth Bryson will be next. And after Kenneth will be Robert Adams. I don't see it. Ronnie Washington. My name is Kenneth Bryson. I'm president of Friends of Prince George's County Libraries and president of Friends of our local library, Akakik. I'd like to begin by thanking County Executive Baker and the Prince George's County government for your continuing support of the Prince George's County Memorial Library System. Our Chief Executive Officer, Kathleen Tees, is submitting a flat budget for fiscal year 2017, as we did last year. Uh, this is how we're doing our part to help with the economic situation facing Prince George's County. On the other hand, we have 19 branch libraries now and more card holders than ever before. 570,000. The library system materials budget was cut by 37% in 2008 and remains the same eight years later. The people in the communities served by branch libraries are still depending on the library for many things. Programs and services offered by the Akakik Branch Library, for example, illustrate this point. Passport applications can be completed at the library, and free computers are available when the branch is open. The diversity of the Akakee community has increased substantially in the past 25 years. Currently, two-thirds of Akakee residents are African Americans. There are three programs being held at the branch during Black History Month. They include a presentation by the Performing Arts Center for African Cultures this Saturday, February the 6th, the following Saturday, 
on February 13, Linda Chavers, Assistant Professor of Instruction in Intellectual Heritage at Temple University, will be giving a guest lecture on race diversity in media. The following uh, Saturday, there will be a community read aloud of the best-selling book, Between the World and Me. Oh, that's a good one. Our libraries are counting on continuing support of Prince George's County government to provide the staff and resources to support programs like this. Thank you very much, County Executive and County Government. Thank you. And now, I will give up my seat. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Are you Robert? Robert, you're on. Uh, good evening. Um, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of things that I want to uh, cover in the budget, um, but I guess the, the first thing that's pressing front of my mind that it's, it's been a year. I'm looking for my body cameras for the uh, police officers. I'd like to see that happen. I'd like to see that happen real soon. Um, I'll just leave that one there. I'm also the uh, president of the uh, PTA over at Capitol Heights Elementary School. Mm -hmm. Capitol Heights, you know, you know, we make the news for a lot of good things. You know, we do a lot of good. Um, one of the things that I'm proud of, the community got together and we built a playground. The uh, Keller, Williams, Keller Williams property management team and the Redskins just built us a brand new media center and library. Um, it's a lot of great things going on, but to see an article in the Washington Post not too recently saying that they're thinking about closing the school. It just makes no sense to me, but I understand that there are some budget situations that's going on and some decisions need to be made, but my major concern is that when these decisions get made that it's not enough community input. I just feel like the community is always on the tail end of things. I think um, when I look at the people that here in black and I just think about it shouldn't really have to come to this. You know what I mean? It's, I, mean I just feel like that the leadership I think that you're doing a great job in being the county executive and moving the county forward, but it's still something missing. It's a disconnect, I think, between the government and the people in the community. I think that the community, we have to do a better job in stepping up and taking more responsibility and making things better inside the schools and in our communities, but at the same time, there's a disconnect. I don't feel like the leadership is really there in the community to make that happen. Um, I've said this to you before. I remember coming to um, budget hearings uh, maybe two or three years ago in the same room. It was mostly government people here. And, you know, I'm just so happy to see so many community residents here, you know, ready to argue and fight because we need this. And I think that when we're looking at this presidential campaign, um, some of the candidates, that's what they're talking about, this political revolution, that it just can't be, you know, when it's just our issue. There's a lot of different issues that we need to be addressing in this county and, you know, and I think we do have the right leadership in place, but it's things that we have to do. We allowed the Republican governor to get elected. I mean, the tur voter turnout was terrible. But right. the leadership in the county did a terrible job in getting us to come out to vote. That's just the reality of it. But again, we suffering, we suffering now because of it. Look at the budget cuts. But who, who do we hold responsible for that? We have to take some of that responsibility. And I'm saying... County is that I just think that you can do a better job in bringing the community into it and holding us responsible. You know, I know it's hard to say, you know, it was your fault. You, you know, that's honest. You know what I'm saying? You got to fix the mess that we kind of put you in. You know? <laughs> you know, but no, nah, but in all seriousness, we are all in this together. You know, and I think this from listening to the farmers tonight, and I, want, I, I really want to talk to some of the farmers because at our school, we have a garden program, and I know that they're planning on planting things. We're trying to teach Thank the kids you. to eat healthy, and I want to connect with some of you. Um, Robert, we're going to make sure that we get the because we got a big crowd out here. We'll make sure they get there, but thank you for, right. for your comment. And thank all you. Right, thank all you. Right. <laughs> Before we bring out, I do want to say this is Robert going back to say he's absolutely right. It, if nothing else, it's great to have people out here because we did have a very few of the uh, of the citizens come out at the original budget hearing, and to have folks come out here, it's it's a real um, is a real help. Garland Reed, and the next after that will be Michael Glanz Glanzy. Uh, I told y'all messing names up. 
Garland Reed. Is that Garland? Good afternoon. Or good evening. Wishing everybody here a prosperous and a happy new year. Uh, I would just like to say that I'm advocating for One World Center for Autism. Uh, I appreciate the uh, help and support that we got from Mr. Baker in the past. Uh, we were one of the agencies that have been benefited from his support. Uh, we'd also like to advocate for new funding and programs for our organization to support some of the things that we can offer for our community, uh, specifically for our kids who have autism and the programs that we are trying to move around and uh, benefit our community because a lot of people in our community don't know about the programs that we offer. I also support the individuals here for the uh, budget, um, I don't know, I think, we, I think we know. We know. We know. We know. Uh, also, I would be remiss if I didn't sit here and talk about the educators in my program. Um, we have not had a raise in five years. We've had 1%, 1% in five years. And our educators do a great job. Um, I do want to say that I am the parent of a uh, child who has autism. Uh, my son um, recently, about three or four years ago, had a very deep crisis problem. Uh, he began fighting, he was very violent, he knocked holes in walls. And our problem was we took him to PG hospital. He could only stay for 24 hours. We ended up taking him to Psychiatric Institute of Washington. Eventually, we had to take him to Shepherd Pratt. My concern is, is that we don't have a crisis intervention program or facility in our county to help our students and our kids when they're in a crisis. We need a place that we can take them to house them. Now, I know that may cost for a lot of money, but there are state programs. My son is also getting state funding but he's also in a program up in Baltimore. There are a lot of programs in Baltimore. Our county pays for a lot of money for him to go to school and stay in those programs. That's hundreds of thousands of dollars every year. Not only my son, but there are plenty of other students, sons, <laughs> girls, that go out of this county to go to programs for a lot of money. That money could be staying in our county if we had a facility to support. I have introduced, I have introduced proposals to our public school system, 2006, 2008, and they turned them down. Okay. Thank you very much. After Michael, it's Jim Zipolt and Aaron Markovic. Markovic. All right, Michael, you're on. Great. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, I promise to you and the crowd is to be very brief in my remarks, um, as I believe you understand the gravity of the situation for the many service providers, including my employer, Melwood. And I want to say I fully appreciate the position you are in with regards to struggling through an operating deficit, and we want to work creatively with you to solve the problem the DD providers are facing. The current bill, PG 41416, does just this because the bill does not just cost the county, but also allows the county to partner with the state to draw down an additional federal match that will bring additional Medicaid dollars into the county. This bill allows the county to take advantage of a 42% federal match that enhances the reach of the needed county funds to more people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. This bill makes good financial, fiscal sense for the county and allows the county to meet its responsibility to its citizens with intellectual and developmental disabilities. I'd also like to extend an offer to the county to further discuss this issue and to really dig into the numbers, and I think we can creatively come to a solution um, to the challenges facing our community. Uh, 
thank you, Executive Baker, for uh, allowing me to speak again. I'm here in support of uh, Bill, Council Bill number 414-16, and I really want to talk about the benefits that the service providers have provided over the years and what a difference they have made. Uh, this is my sister Elsie, Elsie, and uh, she was born in 47. Back then, back then there was nothing, either an institution which was horrible or they stayed at home. Uh, my father got organized a lot of community members, a lot of parents. Out of that came the ARC, which my father was the first founding president. And out of that came other organizations such as Melwood, and then VSI, which is now New Horizons. And uh, we got resource, the ones I'm familiar with, Resource Connections, uh, the Joseph P. Kennedy Institute that provides uh, group homes, Calmer that provides group homes. Anyway, uh, when Elsie was young, and I was young, I would just see her standing by herself, babbling away, usually holding a piece of paper, shaking it. When you spoke to her, there was no eye contact. You know, the lights were on, but no one was home. Well, in the early 50s, the, we got to Ark in 52, we got a special school in Lanham. Uh, that's when training started, and uh, we got, uh, then we got some occupational groups like Melwood going and uh, VSI, which is down New Horizons. And the, the end result here uh, in, front of, in front of you, LC now has been employed by uh, the Bowie Senior Center. She's going to be celebrating her 30th year uh, in the spring. And we want to thank she also works and earns a paycheck there each, each month at New Horizons, that new facility that you helped us build in Tuxedo Chevrolet, and she's in the recycle program there. And it's really not just helping the individuals, but the families, if you can imagine the burden on the families. It, it's, uh, you know, they, she gets help, resource connections and all, health care, keeping doctor's appointments, getting her to doctors, all types of things like that. So we want to thank you for uh, the increase in the wage, but we're hoping that you can pony up like uh, Montgomery County <laughs> and <laughs> come through with the additional funds. Just remember... Where there's a will, there's a way. Elsie would like to speak for a second. Uh, change is right. I do live in a group home. I've been there for I don't know how many years. 1986. 1986. And I appreciate it if you get more money to my staff at Chevrolet. Please, we want to keep it open. They, they support the professional, the professional support facilities. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I I guess I have to follow that, so that's, that's a, a tall order. Um, I, I hope I'll, I'll attempt here. Uh, this is uh, now for something entirely different. Uh, my name is Aaron Markovich. I'm the Executive Director of Maryland Milestones Anacostia Trails Heritage Area, the only state-certified heritage area in Prince George's County. We're committed to preserving and promoting the history, culture, arts, and natural resources sites generally in the Route 1 area, uh, though we're looking to go countywide in the next five years. We're focused on bike tourism in this coming year, with new connections being made to DC through uh, Bladensburg Waterfront Park. I'm here tonight to first commend the county executive and his staff uh, for the amazing work they've done to advance the county, a place I not only work but live. I see the improving schools as a former PTA president and current Girl Scout leader. 
as a re the rebounding economy uh, as a current member of the uh, Greenbelt Homes Board and the stabilizing safety around the county. Um, yet one thing I don't see in the vision uh, or the Baker principles, and something I know that Mr. Baker takes very much to heart, um, is a recognition of the county's history and heritage. Um, I've seen you firsthand during the War of 1812 commemoration. I know your background. Um, and um, those of us working in the field would love to see that recognition acknowledged in some way. Uh, we have a complicated history in this county, to put a slight spin on it, but it's an important history for the region and nation, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, I have three sort of specific requests. We'd like to see investment in heritage tourism as a way to uh, ensure our economy thrives through tourism, which means um, I'm looking for a, a cultural tourism plan um, to be developed uh, countywide. We would, uh, second, we'd like to see an investment um, in bicycles as a tourism opportunity. Bicycle riders bring more dollars, stay longer, and look for unique local products, like those things that our farmers produce. And this is the type of economic investment we need. Finally, we would like to see a recognition of the work of our cultural tourism sites. We cannot move forward without knowing where we came from. Let's make Prince George's a county, a place visitors and residents see as not only a unique uh, it, it, a place where visitors and residents see as a unique location to experience American history. Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you County Executive Baker for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the Prince George's County Food Equity Council tonight. We're a local food policy council for Prince George's County, Maryland. And I'm here as the coordinator to urge you to provide full support to the Agricultural Marketing Specialist in fiscal year 2017. We started our food policy council for the county to provide a democratic platform for residents, farmers, health and anti-hunger advocates, educators and food retailers to come together and transform the food system into one that spurs public health, ensures environmental sustainability, uh, and spurs sound economic development. Of our 22 members, only two have a position which allows them to take a holistic approach and uh, focus on food system change. Uh, one of these members is Kim Rush Lynch. She's able to cultivate economic opportunities for local producers and farmers, and she's also able to look at how to increase access to healthy foods for all. We cannot afford to lose Kim Rush Lynch, the county's agricultural marketing specialist. She provides support for food businesses and farmers through professional assistance in marketing, business development, and navigating regulations. Our members are concerned that defunding this position and the critical support services it provides will threaten the viability of small farms, value producers, and farmers markets across our county. The specialist has helped overcome the barriers small farms and food businesses across the county face in getting their products to market. No small feat. That includes helping them to interpret new regulations, publicizing farmers' events and products through the wonderful newsletter that was mentioned a couple times tonight, and assisting stakeholders in securing grant funding. Many small farms and food businesses simply cannot afford to pay for similar support, which makes a publicly funded position indispensable to their economic viability and bottom lines. The Ag Marketing Specialist has greatly benefited our Food Policy Council as well, as I previously mentioned. She provides us with a direct connection to our county's producers and small farmers markets and allows us to better represent and address their concerns. In fact, right now we're in the process of planning a roundtable discussion with the Prince George's County Economic Development Corporation. Uh, we're focusing it on supporting agriculture and food businesses as drivers of local economic development. We couldn't have accomplished this without the expertise and connections of the Ag Marketing Specialist. The savings generated from cutting funding for this position will be fairly small in the big scheme of things <laughs> for the county. However, its impact on food and farming community in Prince George's County will be immense. Many of our county's farms and food businesses are small, and our farmers markets have nonprofit models. Their staff's hours are spent growing and selling their products, and they have little time to publicize what they do or identify new markets. We appreciate you reconsidering funding for this position and urge you to fully fund it in fiscal year 2017. Thank you. Yeah, 
Good evening, Mr. County Executive, to your staff and to the community all present. I am Victoria Brock, 32 years Prince George's County Police Department, but I come tonight to speak as a 32-year citizen of Prince George's County and ask for your support of something that I think will enhance police services, Boys and Girls Clubs domestic violence issues, sexual assault center, and I find that the disabilities and the farms, because I'm a farm girl, uh, and libraries are also issues that I'm very concerned about. But I think they all lead into having a safer, more progressive community. And I ask for, in particular, for the Palm Park, Boys and Girls Club uh, funding and I think that those services could be increased and it is necessary to have that in the budget and they're not in the budget. Uh, I mean you can get grants for community groups or anything but uh, I don't think we have anything really that just addresses our youth to the point that there are actually specific funds that, go, that are going to them. And I know that if you give them something to do, they won't be committing crimes. So we can keep that down. Um, as far as domestic violence and sexual assaults, I know that you are um, building a uh, center, but I, I also sit on the Maryland Coalition Against Sexual Assault. And so any funding that you can do that will support that branch uh, would be helpful. And God knows domestic violence, uh, considering uh, just yesterday, we know how critical that is. And I think that these are all key areas that will, nothing against the gentleman that spoke for funding for the police department, but I think that if we prevent rather than police, we'll be better off. Thank you. Okay, uh, first of all, it's Raymond Colbert. I know they butchered it, but uh, <clears throat> I'm here basically for two things. Um, first of all, I know when we started the administration, we talked much about transparency. And it's, while we did great strides for our public officials, there's a certain law that seems to be overlooked as far as transparency. This law says, if you support me, <clears throat> you know, it's about education, oddly enough. It said, you know, um, if you support me, we'll have between 600 and 700 million for about five locations and stuff in various states. It says, you know, if you do additional one in this county, it'll jump from 700 to over a billion dollars. And yet we can't find 20 million. <coughs> now, um, <coughs> you know, um, Seems to me, you know, 
this law is being successful, you know, it's supposed to be audited, which means it's supposed to be part of public policy anyway, where anybody could see it. Um, it's, you know, it's so successful that it can't, you know, survive one transition between the Democratic and Republican governor, nor can a certain Democratic presidential nominee talk about it nationally. Now, <clears throat> you know, um, my concern with that is, like I said, you don't see it, so you don't know the numbers. So, obviously, when it comes to stuff like, I don't know, raising property taxes and stuff, you, again, you don't know whether you're making a guess at it or whether we actually need the money. If you tell me that you're concerned about education and you don't know the numbers, it's like, um, I kind of have a challenge for you. If you can't answer, you know, how much we got. And that's go to the bank tomorrow, try to open up, you know, um, home or car or whatever. Ask them to give you some money. And, you know, and then when they ask you how much you have, you tell them, uh, I don't know, I'll get back to you. Um, and see whether you get what you want or whether or not you get laughed out. Because right now, the way it looks to me, I'm waiting to see it on the next episode of American Greed. Now, since I have 30 seconds, I can't, I wanted to praise the county about the public transportation system, but I don't have time to go into details about that, so I guess I'm going to have to. Thank you very much. Good job. Austin Kaba. Ron Bearden. Bearden. Ron Bearden, Ricardo Villaba. Ricardo, come on down. Um, buenas tardes. Good evening, Mr. Buenas Baker. tardes. Buenas tardes. My name is Ricardo Villarra, and I'm a, the substance abuse case manager at the Maryland Multicultural Youth Center, MNYC which is a division of the Latin American Youth Center. We are very grateful for this opportunity to provide input on the formalization of the county's budget. MNYC is a multi-jurisdictional uh, youth development organization with two sites in Prince George County, Langley Park and Riverdale, serving over 650 youth annually, ages 11 to 24, and with you know, kids that are in school and out of school programs. Some, in, some of the programs that we have include GED, job preparation, internships, summer camps, tutoring, game prevention, counseling, and case management. In the last 10 years, we have served almost 4,000 youth in the Prince George County. Our youth are from low-income families, 65% are Latinos, 23% are African American. 50% of our participants were born in the U.S. and the rest abroad. I have been working in Langley Park since January 2013, and in the last three years, I have seen an influx of young Latino immigrants come to the area, most of them coming from Central America. Although I see a lot of resilience among these youth, a lot of them have had very traumatic experiences. Many of them struggle adapting to a new country, learning a new language, a new culture, and reuniting with family members that they did not grow up with. One of the biggest challenges we're facing at our agency and our community is the lack of mental health services, the need for more bilingual counselors, and affordable service providers. In the last three years, I have seen a growth of in depression, anxiety, self-harming, and self-destructive behavior among the youth that we work with. And lately, we've seen a lot of stress caused by the ice rays. So if you see Mr. Obama, if you happen to bump into him, could you please have a conversation? I'll do the same if I run with the governor. Thank you. <laughs> Working with uh, our student in a GD program, I have learned a lot about their educational needs. This county needs to invest more in education, invest in creating adult educational programs similar to Carlos Rosario International Charter School in DC that provides not only English classes, but also offers various technical training at no cost to the student. 
This could provide better techniques and job opportunities, not only for youth who are born and raised in our county, but also youth who are recently arrived. Moses Cook placed 17 year old youth in ninth grade, and these are immigrant youth uh, level classes, making their graduation age anywhere between 21 and 22. This affects the dropout rate that we face in our public school. Building a school that will allow this youth to go to school and work can only make our community stronger. In the last three years of working within Prison County, I have seen a lot of improvement, especially with the Transforming Neighborhood Initiative, also known as TNI. So I think you're doing a wonderful job. Thank I won't continue because of the time, but thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Ricardo. Perfect ending note, too. Chun Kari, Adrian Merber. Chun Kari. Chun, come on up. We're about to miss you, young lady. Dulce Garcia. You're on. You're in. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Good evening. My name is Chun Pari. I'm from um, Burma, and I'm a student of International High School at Langley Park. And I'm really thankful that you give me a chance to stay here and like presenting our school. And our school is so unique. I really like it. I love it. I love to go to school. I have a lot of friends, and we are so like we are all equal. We are, no, I mean no bully and. My, our school is not that much so big, but we're so, I mean, like, working together. And uh, in, in my old school, in my middle school, um, they, have a lot, um, they have a lot of students, and the uh, teacher did not focus on me. But in this school, like, the students were not that much so... So many, but we are all like uh, laughing each other. And, no, just, <laughs> and, uh, okay. And but we really hope that to have a building, cause we are like um, we we learn in a like in the tent something like that. So we want to have a building, cause if uh, if it is weather so cold and if it's raining. Like we got in trouble, and so we hope to have a building. Oh, I'm really thankful for uh, saying things. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Very good job. Um, on behalf of Casa, if everyone would please stand up and support. If you're from Casa, stand. Yes, the Maryland, if you would please stand, stand and support. <laughs> Me, Casa, Sue, Casa, and everybody stand. Okay. <laughs> International High School Langley Park students, if you would please come down to the front. Okay. International High School Langley Park students, if you would please make your way down to the front. Come on down, the price is right. Good evening, executive good evening. banker, and good evening, audience. Uh, my name is Adrian. Uh, I'm from Uganda, and I am a student at Langley Park International School. Uh, one of my main reasons I came here is to say uh, thank you for bringing, uh, bringing up the school. I don't know if it was one of your plans, but I know you did a role in it, and I thankfully Thank you for all your support that you've given us. Uh, what makes our school unique is that uh, we are a family and uh, like when we have a problem, we are there for each other. Though we do not have all we, all we have, but we make it, we make it, we make it, we make an education out of it. And like we, our soccer team did have a great season but one of the main problems was transportation. Uh, we it was hard. Of, it was hard for students to go to practice and.
go home. But we made the use out of it, and we, uh, we did have a great season, and we came in second place in our, uh, in our division. And uh, <laughs> another thing I want to say, uh, this is one of the best schools I've ever went to. Though it's only 100 kids, you can still they teach you and you, you can get an education out of it. And one of, the, one of, our, all, one of our goals is to uh, go to college and be, uh, be uh, like, be a future for America, the next future for America. Then, uh, like, <laughs> and I'm really proud of uh, the teachers that, I don't know if you guys speak them, but the teachers, <laughs> they are really good teachers. They care about us. Uh, the teachers are uh, connected to, with the students. Every weekend they check on us and see what we're doing like to stay out of trouble. You know, like sometimes we fall short and we make bad decisions, but they keep in, uh, in touch in us so that we, like we stay out of trouble and stuff like that. Like, you know, to stay in uh, school doing our homework. And uh, we, I'll ask your support in getting a new facility. And it's kind of hard for uh, my PE teacher doing physical uh, education with the, in a in temp, temporary. Uh, we, if we would ask for your support, and may God bless you. Thank you. Good job. Johnny, you're up. Hi, uh, good evening, executive of bakery. <laughs> it's an honor for me to come here and speak to you. Thank you. It's an honor to hear you. My name is Jan Tun and I and I am a proud founding president of, of Inter I'm a proud founding president. I'm a my bad. <laughs> I'm a proud founding class president and an athlete. So it's an honor for me to come speak here. I'm here. Right, I'm here to represent my school as a, as a leader, and I'm here to represent my school as an athlete. Because ever since I came to this country, I have never seen a school like this. Uh, I've, never, I've never also seen a, a country like this in my whole life. I've gotten so many support from so many people who don't even know me. Like, for example, I don't even know who these are, but they come and help me. <laughs> <laughs> you are it's an honor, and thank you to all of you for supporting our school. It's a tiny school. It's a new school. It's a beginning school. And it's an honor for you guys to come and support us. Thank you. Thank you. Veronica. Hi, good evening. Good evening. My name is Veronica Aguilar. I am from El Salvador. I, come to America, I came to America when I was one year old. I came here to talk about my school, International High School of Langley Park, and my experience. My experience there has been really different from all the schools I have went. I have, I have moved so many times. And this school is amazing because the teachers, they're like your best friends. You can talk to them. And they're like your friends. You don't have to be shy in that class. You, you get support, a lot of support in that school. And because I used to get bullied in middle school, um, but in here, Everybody's like, everybody's equal. Like you can talk to each other. It's not weird or nothing. The teachers are like your friends. And uh, I love our school. It's amazing. Um, I love that school. And um, the portables that we are in is small, but it's something we still come to school to learn. And I would love to have like a building um, because, like, you know, rainy days, snowy days, you can trip, fall, and, like, your stuff get wet. And we have computers. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for being in that school. Um, and I thank you all for all the support that you have given us because I know you want us to have a better education, and I'm very grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Christine Gillard, Gillard, Arthur, and after that will be Ray Owens. 
Good evening, County Executive Baker and guest. My name is Christine Gilliard Arthur, and I am a proud parent and educator of Prince George County Public Schools. I'm just as nervous as they are. <laughs> I have 15 years of teaching experience, uh, eight of which was in the town of Chevrolet at Gladys New Spelman Elementary School. And in my tenure there, I was the first elementary physical education teacher of the year in the state of Maryland. <clears throat> I was the first and still the only demonstration school for Maryland State Department of Education representing best practices of physical education, truly embracing the health and wellness of our students and, and the community. I not only changed the school I was there, I changed the town of Chevrolet in embracing physical activity and the health, healthy eating, gardens, partnering with the Alliance for a Healthier Generation. But I wanted a new challenge. Boy, did I get it. <laughs> Starting a brand new school being, I am now the founding health and physical educator at the International High School Langley Park. And our facility, <laughs> <clears throat> although understanding our facility is temporary, I asked County Executive to move forward with support, full support of Dr. Maxwell's budget and finding a modern facility that embraces not only a school to educate children, but a community that we can change the future of Prince George County Public Schools. Um, I want us to be our best selves. Not just for me, not just for my, my Imani or my Joseph or my Jacob, but for my Jonathan, for my Veronica, for my Chun, for my Adrian, for my Paola, and for my other international high school students and my immigrant students that have a deserve and have a right to be educated because they are citizens. They are going to be here. We need to embrace them. We need to educate them. I want the best opportunity for our students. Education is critical. We know education is critical. We must invest now. Now is the time. Last year you were talking, I was so excited. I was, then I was so disappointed. I don't care how much my taxes fill up. Thank you for your support of education. And I want to say our school educates everyone. We bring, we unify 19 countries and 13 languages. And we don't have to be embarrassed of who we are or where we come from. Let's come together and support our education budget and invest in it now for all of Prince George County Public Schools. Good job. See, see you were nervous at all. Ray Owens, Walter Thaxton, Eileen Lakeham. Ray. I'm Ray Owens. I'd like to thank you, Mr. Uh, County Executive and your staff and all the commissioners for allowing me to speak and everyone else who's here tonight. Um, it's a privilege to be here. I would like to uh, tell you that I'm representing my daughter, Rachel Owens, uh, who attends New Horizon Supported Services. I'm also representing New Horizons because they are a wonderful organization and the work that they do, I just can't praise them enough. Now, my daughter Rachel uh, was born with a condition called Prader-Willi syndrome. It occurs in uh, every 10,000 births, all races are affected by it. It's a multifaceted uh, condition. There are many, uh, problems that cause her to be disabled in different ways. She has weak muscles, poor coordination, and uh, she's affected with petite mal uh, seizures at times. She takes medication for that, which is doing pretty good right now. Rachel uh, graduated from high school in Prince George's County in 1999. She was so distraught. This is one of the worst problems that they face, a person with Prairie to Willie has low self-esteem. Her self-esteem was so low 
she felt so bad, she felt that she had no place on earth to go after she graduated high school. She even told me that she felt so bad that she thought she would go down to the Wilson Bridge and jump off. She just didn't know what to do. She uh, was nothing we could do. My wife and I could help her in that situation. We looked around. We finally found New Horizons Supported Services, which uh, she was apprehensive at first to go, which we all are and anything new. But it didn't take long before New Horizons, wonderful direct support, persons were able to win her over and teach her so many things. She's able to read very well. She doesn't walk too well, but she likes to go out into the community. They take her different places to museums, teach her things about history, and she loves it. These direct support people at New Horizon are wonderful. They're not only there to support her physically, but they teach them. And they spend many hours in school and classes to learn what they're doing, how to teach the individuals with multifaceted problems. So I thank you so much for hearing me. And I ask you, I beg you, please try to find a way to continue to support New Horizon and the other agencies like this. They have no way to make up the shortfall that the mandate has created. We know it's a wonderful thing to have a raise, but if the company is going to go under because of paying the raise, it's not going to work too well. Thank you. Rick. Thank you. Thank you. Walter. Walter. Hi, my name is Walter Paxton. By the number of people leaving, it seems y'all thought I was going to sing, but for the rest of you who stay, I am not going to sing. <laughs> So I'll spare you for that. I started off as a community organizer, worked my way into a city agency, then to a federal agency, where for 30 years we tried funding all kinds of programs, both with local municipals, county agencies, private nonprofits, and we were talking about the same things then that we're talking about now. And the reality is we're going to be talking about those things for some time to come. Because everything that we do that is a necessary thing to do is going to cost money. And that money is going to have to come from someplace and somebody's going to have to make those decisions about how the pie gets divided up. And I know that sounds like a terrible thing to say, but there's some realities. And those realities are we want our streets fixed. We want the firemen to come when our house catches on fire. We want the police department to respond when there's a crime. We want our kids to come out of school knowing how to read because they're still reading articles about why Johnny Steele can't read. And that started so long ago, it happened before I was born. And I'm like, I'm pretty old. I hadn't planned to say anything this evening, but after I got here, I thought, well, I've been quiet for a few years now and giving everybody a break. So let's put it this way, I'm back. I don't claim to represent anybody, but I know a lot of people, I talk to a lot of people, and they talk about things like why they can't get their Verizon bill straight, why they can't get Comcast to come out and fix that problem that they have. Did you all know you have a county agency? right over on Basel Court that has the responsibility for mediating such disputes. I didn't know that. We need some way to publicize that, Rashawn. And I talked to Carolyn Lowe, and she's going to work with us on that. But what I'm trying to say is all that we want is not going to be possible. We know that. Unless we have a secure environment, because the bottom line is no matter what else we want, we all want security. We want to feel safe in our homes, safe on the streets, safe in our malls. Because if we don't have that kind of safety and security, we have nothing. It's always going to be a fight. So I come before you today not to represent the police department, but to see, give you my view on it. And that is, we live in a county that has twice as many people as the District of Columbia, yet we only have half the police police officers. 
Now, we have been fortunate in that there's been a steady downturn in crime. I know this is your comeback, but um, we're going to have You want to, me to stop talking? I'm just afraid we're going to have to take your mic. I'm going to give up my mic. <laughs> but I'm going to say one last thing before I give it up. And that is, we have three classes coming up of new police officers. We need them, but three classes is not enough. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And, and, and welcome back. This is Elena, and then it'll be Tanya Wingfield and Victor Flores after. All right. Elena. Elena, you're on. Good afternoon. My name is Eliam Lackham, and I am a student here at Prince George's Community College. Thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to speak today. Uh, I'm also the student member of the Board of Trustees. And in addition to being a student here, I give back to my community by serving as a court appointed special advocate for foster care. And there's a lot of students here at Prince George's Community College who give back to their community. I'm here tonight to urge the county to increase funding for Prince George Community College in fiscal year 2017. The cost of education is rising, and we want to stay in school. I came in this country. I did not know any English. I am an immigrant, and I was looking for an affordable education. Attending Prince George's Community College is one of the best decisions I ever made in my life because it's totally transformed my life. My story is the same story as many of my fellow students. We want to stay in school. We don't want to be out of school. Many of us as first generation college students, we have no parents sometimes to support ourselves, but we want to come to school because we want a better future. And we need your help for that. Another problem we are facing is that we have 40,000 more than 40,000 students here, and more than half of our students are enrolled in non-credit classes. They are the ones that come back to give to our county. They are the police officer, they are the firefighter. But guess what? They don't get help from the state. They don't qualify for financial aid. We need your help. We really need your help. Thank you so much, and thank you for continuing to support Prince George's Community College. Thank you. To add on to the funding, good evening, everyone. My name is Antonio Morrell. I'm the Student Governance Association president here at Prince George's Community College. Uh, student, the Student Governance Association uh, developed a partnership with the bus and Metro, where we will allow more times uh, for buses to come and pick the students up. Because transportation, commuting from Prince George's Community College in Hyattsville, is, is quite a hike on a metro bus. If we can get a little more funding for transportation to implement this program, that'll be great. Students need to get to school to get the education. Most professors say if you get to class on time, you'll earn that A. But if you're coming to class every day, 15, 20, 30 minutes late, you're going to fail the class. And I know you, County Executive Baker, education is everything and success is the best. So transportation does fall into um, education. Thank you. No, thank you. Tanya Wingfield, Victor Flores, and then Dwayne Dale. Uh, good, evening. good evening. Uh, I have some recommendations on how we can possibly get uh, Annapolis to take us a little serious. Now, one, the handout that you gave us this evening, it talks about some expenditures that would cause us to exceed our budget, but the items that you list have very little explanation, and it gives the appearance that um, when you talk about excessive overtime and agencies not staying within this 2% uh, budget restriction, it makes it seem like it's poor management. So maybe providing us with more information, as the uh, young man said earlier, transparency, so that there's a better understanding. Second thing has to do with our school system. Now, uh, over the last three years, our school system has increased salaries of SASR employees by $30 million, and that doesn't include the benefits or the bonuses that they've received, while teachers, as we had one person said earlier, haven't gotten anything in five years. So it, why don't we look at reducing the spending that you are uh, spending on personnel at SASR 
redirect those dollars to school-based personnel, because that is where our customers are being serviced, our children and our students, and also provide the public with a report on how the Board of Education is addressing, and I brought this up to you last year, uh, Mr. Baker, the $184 million that's being wasted in transportation dollars that Dr. Maxwell has yet to provide a report to the public on how that was addressed. Lastly, justice for whistleblowers. The Board of Education continues to allow whistleblowers reporting procurement violations, which are costing our system millions of dollars. These are, this, this is money that our kids are being robbed of. And these individuals are having their reputation dragged through the mud, and then they are fired based on manufactured evidence, which we have time and time again, shown this to uh, your senior management in the uh, Board of Education. Yet and still, and, this, and, and let me make sure I say that this is in the non-academic area of, of the senior management. I'm not talking in the academic area. And so these people are being treated like they are dirt when they are trying to help children, trying to put money back where it should be, and that's before the kids. So it will show Annapolis good faith if, these people, because you're over the school system, if there's an investigation of these managers, and if necessary, they are fired or they are prosecuted for their actions, because this is a crime against children. Amen. Thank you. Victor. Victor. Dwayne Dale is next, after Victor. All right, Victor, you're on. Hi, good evening. Good evening. Uh, I came here to support for the Maryland Multicultural, Multicultural Youth Center down in Langley Park. My name is Victor Flores. I am 20 years old. I arrived in this country at the age of four from El Salvador. I attended elementary school, middle school, and high school in Prince George's County. I enjoyed school until my high school years. Everything changed. Things got harder, teachers got meaner, and it made me not like school for the moment but I had to uh, get through it. I attended high school for three years. I, I never got into trouble. I attended every day and made perfect attendance. The summer before my senior year, I began to work and money started coming in and I, and I knew this could help at home. Since school was difficult, it made me feel like I didn't want to return. One of my high school goals was to join the Army or Marines, but since I dropped out, that was no longer an opportunity which didn't bother me because I was employed and made money. A few months later, I was laid off, and even though I applied new jobs, I wasn't hired because of GED or high school diploma, which, required, which was required, and I, I have neither. And I, sorry, first time. That's all right, take your time. I then decided to get back on my studies, and my mother spoke to me about a program. I went ahead and looked into the program, contacted them, and they answered all my questions. Everyone was friendly and made me feel like there was something I could achieve, that I could achieve. I am now a member of the Prince George's County Workforce GED program at the Maryland Multicultural Youth Center. This program has created the opportunity to obtain my GED, gain work experience, and better my future in this country. Thank you for your time. Thank you, thank you for your hard work. After Dwayne, it'll be Barbara Selner Webb and Donna Young. Dwayne. Good evening, Executive. Good evening. This is my friend and housemate, John Wathen. Hi, John. I am direct care of John Wathen. We have been together for 28 years. Wow. Okay. I know a gentleman up there said he was 75 and he looked good. I can't tell you how old I am because they all say, wow, he lived a hard life, <laughs> which I have. I'm from Landover, born, well, raised in Landover, and young African Americans, I teach them when you get pulled over by the police, it's no longer Landover, it's Landover. You know, get, it, get it out there. But anyway, on my 53rd birthday, I got a present. My salary got cut in half. Great news. That's great news. Now, a little bit about me. I was a mentor. I coached in Landover for 21 years, coached Little League football. 
They saw John and myself at the games, and they said, Coach, what do, can we do to get in that field? And these are kids with hardened hearts, a lot of them. So when you get into this field, because I was that bad guy too, it softened my heart. Now, the thing that I want to just say is, like I said, being a bad guy, I've suffered several concussions, a broken neck, broken legs. I've been through the ringer. Now, when I go back and think of it and think about it, I was just one concussion away, one broken neck away from being in a group home and having someone take care of me. So how can you say that you can't find the money to pay for support like us? That's what I want to leave you with. Thank you, Dwayne. My name is John Watt. I live in Winchester Lane, and I work for the family service. Family service. <laughs> Thank you. Have a better day. John, you have a best day, too. Thank you. Thank you. Barbara, and then it's Donna Young and Barry Abrams. Abrams? Abrams. Hello, I'm Barbara Solner Webb, a 43-year resident of Prince George's County, and I'm also president of West Laurel Civic Association. I have a meeting next week, so I can't come to the closer uh, uh, That's right. meeting there. Uh, and you've already heard tonight from scores of people eloquently testifying for the most worthwhile causes needing support, and I certainly don't want to at all diminish those pleas especially the enormous needs for individuals with intellectual developmental disabilities, our newer immigrants, et cetera. But unfortunately, there'll never be resources to fully fund the enormous needs, very real, but enormous needs of these individuals unless some magic pot of gold arrives. I would like to turn to a different point, though, that it's critical to keep up the needed infrastructure, our aging infrastructure, until this critical pot of gold arrives that these needed things can get replaced when they have totally worn out. Um, and obviously it is the repair and maintenance that allows things to survive <coughs> longer until there's time for its replacement. As you may remember, at last year's budget hearing, I happened to be sitting next to our count wonderful councilwoman, Mary Lehman, who gave me the numbers that with the amount of money the county can budget for road resurfacing, the cost per mile of road resurfacing, and the number of miles in the county, our county can only resurface roads once every 750 years. So that means a road can only be resurfaced three times since the birth of Christ until now. So it's absolutely critical that the pothole repairs be done as methodically as possible to try to make these roads survive for the next 749 years until there will be money to resurface them. And since I testified last year, your DPWT has done a wonderful job in replacing or repairing the worst of the potholes in our neighborhood. And I'd like to congratulate them, congratulate you, hope that the remaining of our potholes and our new ones similarly get repaired and that throughout the county they continue to get repaired because our wonderful county needs its infrastructure to remain intact, that people can get to work, that they can live, that their cars don't break down as they're driving. So thank you very much for your hard budget decisions. <laughs> thank you, Barbara. Thank you for coming out. Donna Young and then Barry. Good evening. My name is Donna Young and I hope to get through two issues very important mm -hmm. to my, and dear to my heart which are seniors and children. Um, Prince George's County of all of the other uh, counties, surrounding counties, does not provide enough support in terms of transportation for our seniors. It's unfortunate that if a, uh, I own an assisted living facility and we were in a situation when we built the home that we were in Bowie, and that was just rezoned, and now we no longer have access to the bus, call a bus, or even metro access, because we're not within one mile of a bus stop. 
What you do when you don't allow assisted living facilities to have um, a grandfathered um, access to transportation is one, you limit us as um, small businesses being able to support them, but also you limit our seniors in, in being able to have some sense of the independence. Metro access used to come to the facility and then all of a sudden now it won't show up. The bus won't come because they said we are a facility. Yet the county requires that we, under Fred, register our facilities so that you can, in fact, provide um, services in the event of emergency, but you won't provide any services for our seniors um, when they need it to go to church or when they need it to go to their doctor's appointment. And it's very expensive for us. I really think that this needs to be addressed. The other thing is with Medicaid. Medicaid will provide a nursing home $10,000 for a level three person. But that same person that they try to transition into assisted living, Medicaid would only pay a $1,700 to take care of them. And if the individual was to go off to a daycare during the day, we'd lose $40 a day for that person. That's insane. And the same person, if Medicaid can receive $10,000 for them, at least consider giving us half of that money to take care of our seniors. The second thing is, hopefully I can get through this, is Prince George's County Public Schools. We have talked, you know, we've spoken at the budget hearings last year. In 2008, sir, there were, um, 2000, I'm sorry, 2011, there were seven chiefs and one deputy and a superintendent. Uh, in 2012, eight chiefs and one deputy. Let, I'm gonna jump since I got 30 seconds. 2014, we went to 10 uh, chiefs, two deputies, and one COO. We now are at 13 chiefs, one chief of staff, three deputies, four associate superintendents for Prince George's County, where we're having a loss of students, and all of that is in SASA, and we're not paying out teachers to educate our kids. This is insane. Thank you. After Barry, it's Maria Neves and Nohim, Nohim Canberra. Good evening, County Executive. Thank you for the work that you're doing in Annapolis. I see you doing battle on those videos. Your social media is doing well. I'm here testifying to urge county leadership to support full funding for the position of agricultural marketing specialist. Prince George's County Planning Department is defunding the position as of the Agricultural Marketing Specialist for FY 2017 in response to a structural deficit. This has been an important position within the University of Maryland Extension. It's especially important given there is no agriculture director sitting at the county executive level who manages all things in this sector and reports directly to the county executive. The person currently filling the position, Kim Rush Lynch, has been key in organizing, facilitating, and pushing the local Prince George's County agriculture message. When I need something agriculture related, I turn to the agriculture marketing specialist. She partners and builds relationships with traditional and urban farmers, food entrepreneurs, and any organization connected to agriculture. She has monitored legislation that affects local farmers and food producers in this county, as well as worked with legislators and, and government agencies to identify challenging laws and regulations based on what's happening in real time with her constituents. The, results, the result has been improved management of farmers markets, broadening the pool of consumers at the markets, more facilitation and, and matching between agriculture producers and consumers. The agricultural marketing specialist position is needed Prince George's County residents are getting their money's worth and then some from Kim Rush Lynch, who is showing dynamic leadership and commitment to the job. Please fully fund the Agricultural Marketing Specialist position for FY 2017. Next uh, issue is Conference and Visitors Bureau funding for tourism. My question, can you tell me the sources of the Conference and Visitors Bureau's funding? I have been told the funding for the Conference and Visitors Bureau comes from the state of Maryland. Most successful conference and visitors bureaus with winning tourism programs derive funding from the hotel tax and other taxes levied against tourism-related businesses. Question, 
Why doesn't Prince George's County operate this way? If the Conference and Visitors Bureau receives funding from the state of Maryland, but not from tourism related taxes, this explains why there is a lack of marketing and promotion around Prince George's County tourism. Question, County Executive, if tourism related taxes are being diverted from the Prince George's County Conference and Visitors Bureau, when will the Executive's Office and the County Council amend legislation to route tourism dollars to the CVB? Thank you, have a good evening. Thank you, good, good question. Maria Narvez. Maria Narvez, Nohimi, Cambara, Nohimi, Cambara. That's it. Is that it? Time? Okay. Um, thank you very much for coming out. Let me just say this before I close it for the evening. Uh, our next hearing is where? Tuesday. Tuesday. In Laurel. That's the February 9th. Yeah. We're at 9th at, uh, at 7. But I do want to thank um, especially those individuals uh, who came here to talk about um, the disability and, and those issues and getting folks here and the students. On personal level, I know how hard it is to get people in and out of these facilities. So I want to thank you for coming out and for attending this hearing. So thank you very much. And come on now, you're going to be our last speaker. You're going to close this out. And you said two minutes. I'm putting it on two. You got to tell us who you are and what you're talking about. Hello, my name is Brenda Caesar. I live here in Upper Marlboro. Um, I wouldn't have your job for all the money in the world. <laughs> but we're here to help you to support us. I was on a task force um, in Vision Prince George's County. And I chose to be on the section for transparency. We worked like nine weeks putting a plan together and saying that, you know, we needed to know what our leaders are doing for us and how they're doing it. It all seemed great in the beginning, but after the task force ended, we never heard not one word. And then I got something yesterday, I guess this election time is coming up, and it's called Imagine. I don't live in Bowie, but it's for the people in Bowie, and they were starting these meetings that start on February 13th. They want to know how you get to work, how you like living in Bowie, you know, all these other things. And, and again, it's just another ploy. We offered to help you and everybody else. Somebody was talking about the nursing homes. My mom was in a nursing home. I made them give me 24-hour access. There is no way. I would have my loved one in a nursing home if I could help it. And then to find out the kind of money that they're receiving. My uncle was in one, and I made it so I could get in and out when I wanted to. They were so awful. After he left there, I volunteered. I was sending the things that I wanted to volunteer to be on there. And I guess they thought that I knew so much about what was going on that they wouldn't even accept me as a volunteer. And I just think that, you know, everything is crazy. And again, with the transparency, there are a lot of us. There are a lot of us that are retired. I'm willing to serve and do any place. I worked at a bank for 39 years. I, I'm, yeah, I worked at a bank for 39 years. I retired as a senior vice president in commercial construction. I know about numbers. If there is anything that, and that's why I got on the board for transparency. I need to know what's happening to our money to know that you're doing what we expect to be done with our money. Okay. Thank you very much and thank you for closing us out. Thank you very much and everyone be safe going home. <laughs>